Well, how many million Mother's Day cards do you think were opened this morning? Some of them big cards, and by that I mean the size of window air conditioners. I have seen cards that size. Small cards into which is tucked maybe a, a check or some cash. Flowery pink greeting cards. Funny cards that have red noses or kittens on them. Greeting cards that make noise and others where the only sound elicited is soft sobbing. The cards are all over the place. And then there are those greetings that are written inside the cards. That is, if the sender did not allow the Hallmark Commissioned Writer's Cards words to suffice, words like, thanks for always being there, thanks for all you do, you should know how much the entire family loves you so much, and on this day, we find ourselves asking, just how do you quantify that love? Love is such a slippery subject. I honestly don't know how the person for whom English is a second or third language gets it. What please, that person might say, is the definition of love? Well, love is when you really like or appreciate or value someone or something very much, okay then, could you please use it in a sentence? I love a cool breeze on a hot summer day. I love the excited rush of my puppy dog when I come home at the end of a long day. I love a banana split with ripe red strawberries and homemade fudge and real whipped cream. I love my wife or my husband with whom I plan to spend all the days of my life. I love my Savior, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And suddenly, our learner, for whom English is a second or third language, says, um, let me get this straight. You love a cool breeze, your puppy dog, ice cream, your spouse, and your God. Yeah, that's right. And you use the very same word love to describe how you feel about each one of them. Well, yes, that's right. Well, pardon me for saying so, but how can the same word apply equally and justly to each one of those? Is God like your puppy and your wife like ice cream? Help me out here. <laughs> Maybe this is something we need to figure out before we write another Mother's Day card. Certainly it's a question we need to come to terms with as we look at the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. When Paul talks about the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, what does he mean? And when he says that nothing can separate us from that love, what does that mean? We have to understand where Paul is coming from. Verses 31 through 39 are a summary paragraph in this section of Scripture. Just as chapters 1 through 4 of Romans comprise one unit, chapters 5 through 8 comprise another unit. Paul has been talking about life in Christ and how we come to this life. He has been discussing the role of baptism and what that means as we establish this relationship with God. He even, in chapter 7, goes through that gut-wrenching discussion about the tug of war in his own life when he does things he does not wish to do and does not do things he should do, but comes out on the side of the life in the Spirit. In general, then, what Paul has been talking about in the run-up to these verses has been salvation, how we come to salvation, how that salvation is confirmed to us, what the role of the Spirit is in our redemption. He has showed us what God did through Jesus to make possible our salvation, and he proclaims that all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. He tells us that God's grace through Jesus is love. All of which brings us to verses 31 through 39. It is as though at the beginning of this paragraph, Paul clears his throat <clears throat> so he might make one last grand point. He says, with all this in mind, what are we to say? Do you see it in verse 31? With all this in mind, all eyes on Paul who then completes his thought. If God is for us, 
Who can be against us? In short, here is how the love of God works for his people. Two points this morning. One, God's people are no longer accused. What Paul does here is set up a courtroom scene. We should be able to see this and understand it by virtue of the language he uses. Who will be the accuser of God's chosen one? We see the prosecuting attorney set up shop. It is God who pronounces acquittal. Then who can condemn? The one who pronounces acquittal is obviously the judge. It is Christ who pleads our cause and suddenly we have the defense attorney. But the fact of the matter for all who are in Christ is this, there is no longer accusation. Do you remember the first time you ever stood accused? I'm going to guess that for most of us, it happened in early childhood with a sibling or a playmate. Maybe you both wanted the same toy at the same moment And one of you wrested it from the other, and that led to tears and anger and frustration and loud words and a parent entering the room demanding to know what had happened. You both try to pour out your story, but basically it comes down to this, he did it, no, she did it, he did it, she did it. And on and on this exchange goes, as long as the parent will allow it, it's all about accusation. He did, she did. You know those famous he said, she said conversations, kind of like that. But it's nothing more than the exchange of accusations. Visit Venice, Italy, and outside the Doge's Palace you will find something. I don't even know how to characterize this this being who has been cast into the wall, and it is called the Mouth for Secret Accusations. In other words, if you had something against someone else, if you felt aggrieved, you could leave an anonymous complaint in the mouth of this grievous horrid being, just place it inside there, and that complaint would be received. As a result, the inquisitors of the state would take care of it. Very likely, whoever was accused would be called on the carpet, and sometimes those people were even silently disposed of. Talk about living under the fear of accusation. The television news provides plenty of accusation fodder too. Celebrity husbands and wives on the outs with each other. A political figure who gets his hand caught in the proverbial cookie jar. Have you followed what's going on in Flint, Michigan with the city water supply? There's enough accusation in that city to last a lifetime. The thing is that you and I have earned accusation based on our behavior. Earlier in the book of Romans, Paul reminded us that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, no exceptions, different sins, all accused, same consequences, all fall short of the glory of God. That literally means we are arrows that have missed the mark as a result We have earned the accusation of God. Put us on the stand. Let the prosecution go after us. The prosecutor might say, have you sinned? And we might say, well, if by sin you mean have I murdered anybody or robbed anyone? No, I haven't done that. No, I mean, have you sinned? Well, I haven't done anything worthy of putting me in jail. No, I mean, have you contravened the will and purpose of God? Have you committed any act which is outside the desire of God? Is your life so totally right with God that you have never stepped over the line? Well, none of us is that good. We have all earned a place before the accusing finger of the Lord God. And yet, God did not spare his own son for us so that when we trust him, we achieve a new status, we are no longer accused. The one person who has the right to accuse us, chooses to do that no longer because of Jesus. This is the amazing thing. God gives us this great gift. He gives us the largest gift we could ever hope for in Jesus. We no longer stand accused. I was a high school junior and Barbara Guile was my English teacher. I enjoyed English class. 
after I figured out what nouns and verbs were in the seventh grade, I really enjoyed English class, and I did, did well enough in class. Not to get an A in English class would have been surprising and devastating for me. Even in, in the routine, daily stuff, I was going to get an A, or certainly nothing less than a B. Imagine my shock and dismay, my utter horror, when a paper came back to me with a large red D on it. Now think about it for a moment. You're a high school junior. You're not that far from making college applications. Your college acceptance and every financial consideration rests on your high school grades. Every single class is important. Your standing in your high school class is important. Will I be able to make the top 10%? If I do get a cumulative 3.5 GPA, will that matter for certain scholarships? I'm really close, really close. That's the kind of stuff that's going through your head. So what did Mrs. Guile do? When my third quarter grade card was distributed, it carried my usual high grade, but there was something else. She included this little notation, which though it was many, many years ago, I can still quote verbatim. It said, you may rest assured that I have forgotten that disastrous test. <laughs> Talk about grace. Talk about no longer being accused. Why are we no longer accused? Because we have placed faith in Jesus who died, who was raised from the dead, who sits at the right hand of the Father, who makes intercession for us. We no longer have to plead for ourselves. Jesus pleads for us. We are freed. We are liberated. This is the first way on this Mother's Day that we are able to quantify the love of God. It is so great that we who know Jesus no longer have to bear the burden of accusation. We are freed from the pointing finger of God. Instead, that finger is rather crooked, telling us, come here. His love means that our guilt is no longer a consideration. In Christ, we are free at last. Here's the other thing. As followers of Jesus, as a people whose faith is no longer in ourselves but instead is in God, we are no longer separated from God. That's it. No longer separated. Do you remember the Apostle Paul's favorite phrase? This is so brief, even though you don't know Greek, you can learn it in Greek. It is en Christo, in Christ. He used that phrase tons of times. Where do we live as followers of Christ? In Christ. How do we describe our lives? They are lives in Christ. In whom is our hope? Our hope is in Christ, and nothing shall separate us. Of course we live in a world where things and people threaten to separate us. Some of that separation is deliberate. Some of it is by our own choice. Sometimes we build walls deliberately to keep others out and others in. Interesting that Jesus has been in the business of tearing down walls. As Paul said elsewhere in his letters, the wall of partition between us and God, he went to the cross, Jesus did, to destroy. As a result, nothing shall separate us. Take it to the bank. We are no longer accused, and now we can say nothing separates us. Consider where separations happen. Paul gave a very interesting, if not comprehensive, list of things that might separate us from God. We find ourselves imagining how that separation might feel. I mean, have you ever felt loss as though you were on the other side of a chasm from someone or something that mattered? Were you ever at odds with somebody that you had previously been close to? What was that separation like? What did it feel like? Was it the, the cold night of distance? Was it bitter winds that divide? Was it the void of loneliness? The belief that there's this irresistible gulf or just knowing or believing will never be at one again? Have you felt that kind of separation? Spiritually, we can feel that kind of separation. Separation is a kind of loneliness and frustration as though we're put out to pasture or regarded as less than human, disregarded, miserable, sitting in our own slew of sin, 
caught in the misery of the moment, somewhere where we feel like we can't get back, that we'll never get back. For some folks, that separation in their minds puts them on the far side of a chasm from God. Yet God has a different answer for this question. What shall separate us from the love of God? For those who trust Jesus, nothing in the angelic world can separate us. Not thrones, not cherubim, not seraphim. Nothing in the political world can. Not powers, not dominion, not might. Nothing in the supernatural world can. Not angels, not archangels, not principalities. All of those things can look powerful, but they cannot do the job, for the love of Christ is stronger. You may say, but you don't know the kind of life I've lived, the kind of problems I've faced. You're giving me too simple an answer for the kind of hard life I've lived. I want you to notice something about this passage that often goes overlooked. Verse 36. We are being done to death for thy sake all day long, as scripture says. We have been treated like sheep for the slaughter. Notice that Paul did not say we would not face miseries or trials. He did not even suggest that we would never fail. He said none of that has the power to overcome us. God's love has the power to overcome all of it. That's why he can boast in verse 37, in spite of all, overwhelming victory is ours through him who loved us. Let the world think what it will. Let others assign whatever convictions they will to us. We know better. Jesus has the final word, and the word is victory. Everything else is temporary. And in the midst of all the miseries we may face, Christ's love will not be denied. We, the followers of Jesus, are super conquerors. The love of Christ is the banner over our lives. His love courses through our veins. Nothing can take it away. Nothing can diminish it. Yes, the word love will be bandied about a lot today. It is splashed on greeting cards it will be spoken in telephone calls. Some will feel guilt for not making more of the love they're supposed to feel. And love will provide the motivation for acts of kindness. But God's love, the love of God in Christ, there is something you can quantify by the way of salvation. A love that tore down the wall of partition a love that has challenged the gates of hell, a love that brings to men and women and boys and girls salvation. What do we say about this love in the face of today, in the face of common miseries and uncertain woes? Just this, death may come, but its hold on the victor is only temporary. Life may challenge, but the victory over the believer, temporary. Spirits may invade our space and their claim over believers, but they are temporary. Superhuman powers, but such power with believers, temporary. The world as it is, temporary. The world to come, temporary. All the forces in the universe attacking the believer, temporary. All heights, whatever they are, temporary. All depths, wherever they may go, temporary. Because nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, no longer accused, no longer separated. We belong to Jesus. That's our story. That's our life.